Hello fellow health seeking humans. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jake. SIBO is the number one cause of IBS, according to Dr. Pimentel and his team at Cedar sinai Some of you also expressed interest in learning about the link between IBS, SIBO, acute gastroenteritis, aka food poisoning, and anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin antibodies. Hi everyone, Editing Jake here. I just want to let you know that I spent over two and a half hours making this freaking graphic, so I hope you like it. Thank you. It's estimated that 10 to 20% of the adult population of the world suffer from IBS, so, you know, approximately anywhere from 550 million to 1 billion people. And now that you know how common IBS is, think about how common food poisoning is, which is the cause of SIBO. I mean, who hasn't had food poisoning at least once in their life? That was my dainty puke noise. You do your undainty one. <laughs> so before I get into all of this, I wanna make it very clear that it is possible to develop SIBO and IBS months after the initial uh, 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 event of food poisoning, and perhaps that initial infection wasn't even that severe. For example, I got SIBO after getting acute gastroenteritis while on vacation, and it wasn't that big of a deal. I had to stay in our hotel room for 24 hours. There was diarrhea, and it took several days to feel all the way back to normal, and a few months after that, that's when I developed SIBO. So let's go over the sequence of how food poisoning, aka acute gastroenteritis, causes SIBO and how SIBO causes IBS. Food poisoning can be caused by either a viral or bacterial infection, and the research we're talking about today is about bacterial infections. The number one bacteria implicated in acute gastroenteritis in the US, the UK, and probably other places is Campylobacter jejuni. Other common bacteria include E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, and Vibrio cholerae, which is the bacteria that causes cholera, which is also a dish that I've talked about in previous videos. What all these bacteria have in common is a toxin called CDTB, which stands for Cytolethal Distending Toxin B. Let's break down the word. So Cytolethal stands for cell and deadly and distending refers to the enlargement that the mammalian cells experience when they come into contact with this toxin. And the B stands for biatch. I, I, I don't know what it stands for. I looked it up on Wikipedia. It was confusing, and I think probably not that relevant to what we're talking about today. CDTB basically damages and distends mammalian cells, and then the mammalian cells die through apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and it's programmed to protect us, the host. CDTB is a part of most, if not all, of the bacterial pathogens that cause acute gastroenteritis. So when we get food poisoning, our immune system creates antibodies directed at CDTB. Unfortunately for us, CDTB happens to look very similar to a protein in our GI tract called a vinculin. When our bodies mistakenly attack our own tissues because it looks like something foreign, this is called molecular mimicry, which is one of the ways that our bodies can start an autoimmune disease process. Our bodies first create the anti-CDTB antibodies, and then they create the anti-vinculin antibodies. And as an aside, I did have one of my subscribers ask a really good question. If the anti-vinculin antibodies are circulating throughout the bloodstream, does this mean that it is attacking other vinculin throughout our body? And I had the opportunity to act ask Dr. Razai this question, and he said that the vinculin in our GI tract looks different from vinculin in other parts of the body, so it's unlikely that it, our vinculin's getting attacked everywhere in our body. So not everyone develops anti-vinculin antibodies, but rat studies have shown that the more times that the rats have uh, exposure to Campylobacter jejuni, the more likely they are to develop SIBO. Scientists have found that anti-vinculin antibodies attack vinculin in nerve cells and in a certain type of cell called interstitial cells of Cajal, and I'm assuming that Cajal is some dude. Oh, his name is Santiago Ramon y Cajal, and he was, um, oh, born in 1852. Oh, he like older men. <laughs> He died in 1934. Yeah, I like them so old they're dead and they've already left me money. So the body mistakenly attacking these cells instead of anti-CDTB leads to loss of these cells. 
And these cells are integral in the process that is called phase three of the interdigestive motor activity. It's also called the migrating motor complex or MMC for short. To put it very simply, the small intestine has two modes. One is the digesting mode and one is the sweeping mode. And the phase three refers to the sweeping mode. These contractions only happen during a fasting state and they sweep the small intestine of food debris so that the food debris isn't sitting around in there and feeding or allowing those microbes to overgrow. Impaired small intestinal motility is what contributes to bloating. Not only is the gas not being moved out, but the food's not being moved out. So the microbes in the small intestine use that food to overgrow like weeds and they ferment those foods and create the excess gas. So this is how you develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. And yes, you can have slow motility in the small intestine and fast motility in the large intestine, AKA diarrhea. And scientists have shown that when you infect rats with Campylobacter jejuni, the ones that go on to develop SIBO have less interstitial cells of Cajal or fewer, I should have said, than the ones that don't go on to develop SIBO. And scientists have also shown that when you infect rats with Campylobacter jejuni that has been genetically modified to take out the CDTB, those rats are less likely to go on to develop SIBO and IBS. And conversely, they have shown when you infect rats with just CDTB without any bacteria, they go on to develop IBS. So I've shown you how acute gastroenteritis leads to anti-CDTB antibodies, which leads to anti-vinculin antibodies, which is an autoimmune disease process, which leads to the destruction of nerve cells, including interstitial cells of Cajal, which leads to impaired motility, which then leads to SIBO. Now I need to show you how SIBO leads to IBS. I was running out of room over here. So I went to read the research all the way back in the year 2000, when some of you were just a twinkle in your parents' eyes. And some of us are just a wrinkle in our children's eyes. Hey, Jamie Picker, everyone. And I read the first study in which the eradication of SIBO led to the improvement of GI symptoms and IBS. So this study was done by Dr. Pimentel and colleagues, and they looked at 200 patients with IBS and evaluated them for SIBO, and 78% had SIBO. So a proportion of these people were treated with antibiotics and those whose lactulose breath tests, which is one of the ways you can test for SIBO, the ones that went from positive to negative had significantly less abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. Soon after that, Dr. Pimentel and colleagues conducted a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study, which is sort of the gold standard of these types of studies. And once again, they showed when they take participants that have IBS and SIBO as proved through a lactulose breath test and take those results from positive to negative, they have significant improvement in their symptoms. So now we had pretty good proof that treating SIBO improves symptoms in those with IBS. So then Pimentel and colleagues showed that patients with IBS have significantly lower frequency of phase three of the MMC, which are those sweeping motions that I talked about earlier. My small intestine and I have something in common. My small intestine doesn't like to sweep and I don't like to sweep. So not only did they show that people with SIBO have less frequent phase three waves, they also showed that they have phase three waves that are less long than healthy controls. They found that healthy controls had on average 2.2 phase three events in a four hour period of fasting, while those with SIBO had only 0.7 on average. And so just to go back to a little bit of elementary school math, in order for the average to be 0.7, that means that there were a proportion of SIBO patients who had zero phase three events in the four hour period of fasting. That sucks. Phase three for healthy controls lasted around seven minutes, but for those with SIBO, it lasted only five minutes. And if you're making a that's what she said joke right now, you, you can leave, you can leave. If I never hear a that's what she said joke ever again, I will die a happy woman. So these decreased and shorter phase three events are what contributes to SIBO relapse. So that's why it's imperative for those with SIBO to be on a prokinetic after treatment. And prokinetics are uh, medicines that help with the motility of the small intestine. And many of these drugs, when taken at a smaller dose, only work in the small intestine and not also the large intestine. So you have less risk of giving people diarrhea. 
So the link of food poisoning to IBS had already been made prior to the link between uh, food poisoning and SIBO, and so this was called post-infectious IBS. So a meta-analysis, which is a type of study that takes a bunch of studies and does some fancy-ass statistics to combine the results of all the studies found that the estimated risk of developing IBS after food poisoning is around 10%. So next came some rat studies. Dr. Pimentel and colleagues infected rats orally with Campylobacter jejuni, and they found that over half the rats had altered stool consistency over three months after the initial infection. So after euthanizing the rats, they showed that the rats that had developed SIBO were more likely to have altered stool consistency and lower body weight. So once again, this shows us the strong relationship between the trifecta of acute gastroenteritis, IBS, and SIBO. Researchers and doctors have been focusing a lot on stool tests, especially when the patients are suffering from diarrhea and or constipation. And this on its face makes sense because these symptoms are symptoms of your butthole. Oh my. But when we can't figure out the cause of IBS by repeatedly looking at stool, maybe we should look somewhere else. And this is where the SIBO breath test comes in. I cannot say this enough. Stool cannot tell you what's going on in the small intestine. Everyone say it with me. Stool cannot yeah, tell you what's going, going on in the small, in the small intestine. intestine. One more time. Stool, stool cannot tell, tell you what's, what's going, going on in the small intestine. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked it up. I fucked it up. We're done, we're done, we're done. So for those of you that are not familiar with the SIBO breath test, briefly, the patient drinks a sugary drink, usually lactulose, and then you breathe into a bag with a tube every 15 to 20 minutes for about two hours. And then the lab tests the gases in each of those bags. There is currently only one test on the market called the TRIO Smart Breath Test that measures for all three gases. So that's hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. All the other tests only measure the first two, and so I think it is important to get hydrogen sulfide done to really get a complete picture of what's going on. And these three gases are what contribute to the GI symptoms. So studies have shown that having a methane predominant result on your breath test is highly correlated with constipation. So these studies have shown that higher methane on the breath test is directly correlated with more constipation in the form of less frequent bowel movements and harder lil poops. Lil poops, that's my rapper name little poops. So the way that this works is that these gases are called gasotransmitters, and that's just the fancy name for gases that contribute to biological processes in the body. Scientists have shown that when you infuse methane into the small intestine of animals, that slows the transit time through their GI tract, as opposed to when you infuse other animals with room air. Methane most likely slows intestinal transit time by increasing contractions that are called segmental contractions, which go on both sides and mix the food, as opposed to peristalsis, which is a contraction that just pushes the food in one direction. Segmentation slows down the movement of this partially digested food and then leads to constipation. Since the test for hydrogen sulfide was only developed recently, scientists have only been able to show that hydrogen sulfide is highly correlated with diarrhea. Editing Jake back to tell you that I forgot to tell you how hydrogen sulfide might cause diarrhea. We don't know for sure, but hydrogen sulfide is thought to act as a smooth muscle relaxant, hence the diarrhea. So methane is highly correlated with constipation and hydrogen sulfide is highly correlated with diarrhea, but that doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions to these rules. These are uh, associations that come out when you take large groups of patients and do fancy ass statistics. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, I'll put my SIBO playlist in the video description box below. And patients are less likely to be positive for both methane and hydrogen sulfide because these two, the microbes that produce these two gases, compete for the same resource in the form of hydrogen. You can think of them as two predators competing for the same food resource. So now I have shown you how acute gastroenteritis leads to anti-CDTB antibodies, which leads to anti-vanculin antibodies, which is an autoimmune disease process, which leads to the loss of nerve cells, including interstitial cells of Gahal, which leads to slow motility, which leads to SIBO, and the gases in SIBO lead to the uh, IBS presentations of diarrhea and or constipation. 
Now give this video a freaking like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I've mentioned this in other videos, but there are a few tests out there where you can test your anti-vinculin antibodies, and that shows you that you do have an autoimmune disease process going on in your small intestine, and it also shows you how important uh, Proconex will be for you. And how important it is for you to avoid food poisoning for the rest of your life. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jake, and I really want to make helping people navigate their chronic illness through these edutainment videos my job, and there are a few ways you can help me do that. I make earrings for fun, and you can find the link to my Etsy store in the video description box below. I also sell my Bartonella Babe merch. 25% benefits the Bartonella Project at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine, led by Dr. Breitschwert. And um, if you'd like to support my channel, and if you are in a position to do so, you can consider donating to my channel through PayPal or Venmo, and the information for that will be in the video description box below this video as well. Bye, fellow health-seeking humans! Bye! When my mom's walking Piper throughout the complex, there's this man, oh, boy, sleep, I want to get back to <laughs> and he calls her poops Little Tootsie Roll poop, so her rapper name's Little Tootsie Roll. Because his dogs are like logs. <laughs> dog log. Dog log. Little, little big, big, big dog, dog log. log. Big dog log. Oh, that's big good. Dog. That's really good.